Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice, where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now the article I've selected this week is Constraint Induced Movement Therapy After Stroke by Quackel and colleagues. So what does this paper deal with? As you likely know, a stroke occurs when you get a blood clot somewhere in your brain. So the brain runs on blood. If you get a clot and blood can't flow past it, any area of the brain past that clot can start to wither and die away. Now, because of the vasculature in the brain, a lot of strokes happen over what are called the motor areas of your brain. So this is why post-stroke, a lot of people lose the ability to move their limbs. Now, for the longest time, we thought, whatever you came out of a stroke with, that's what you got. If you lose the ability to use your left hand, I'm sorry, you're just not gonna use that left hand anymore. But then an interesting thing happened. So a researcher working with monkeys found that exactly the same thing. If monkey loses the ability to use his left hand, stops using his left hand, uses the right to do everything. Cool. But this researcher found that if by accident that right hand couldn't be used for something, if it got stuck behind his back or something like that, then this once useless left hand would start to come back online. Which led to the important question, post-stroke, if, if the brain can still handle the movements, why wasn't it occurring? Where was the break? And this is where we came up with the theory of learned non-use. So it turns out after a stroke, some people still have complete musculature. It's just harder. They struggle more. They fail sometimes when they try and use that arm or that hand to do something. So they quickly teach themselves not to, and they just keep using their good arm. And over time, this starts to wither and die away, not because you can't use it, but because you've trained yourself in all these situations to think, well, better use my right hand. So that's where this paper comes in. These researchers did a review of the literature to see, okay, when you have a stroke and you lose your left hand, but I tie up your right one and you have to use the left, how much can we bring back online? So as I dig through the research, they found two really, really interesting things that I think swing back to us. One, if all I do is tie up your good arm, doesn't really do much. You don't gain a lot of momentum from your paretic limbs if all I do is tie this up. But it turns out there's a second way to do force use. So it's a subtler way, it's called Constraint Induced Movement Therapy, or CIMT. CIMT says, okay, we're gonna start slow, and we're gonna have like a nice six week practice where all we do is do subtle movements with your paretic hand. And throughout these six weeks of slow building movement, we're constantly accessing that, that story saying, okay, so what does this mean about non-use? Oh, I guess you have more function and you start to change the way you think. After a couple of weeks of that training, we then go into force use and now they start watch as things start to come online very fast. So when all I do is force use, throw you in the deep end, not a lot. But when I do this slow burn and we do the thinking and learning and building over time, that's when we can see tremendous growth post-stroke. So what does this mean for education? We know learning styles don't exist, that's a myth, but learning preferences certainly, certainly do. So where do learning preferences come from? Well, it comes from the same learned non-use mechanism as post-stroke does. So imagine I've got a kid and that kid has two options, A or B, and it was really easy for them to engage with A. What starts to happen is, in the future, they start to seek out more of A and push B further and further away. Over time, the entire system will adapt, will change, will shift, till it looks like all they can do is A and B is totally out of bounds. But it was never inborn, it wasn't ever in here. It sprung from that initial choice and that idea that because B was hard, because I had to use effort, I was just gonna push it further and further and further away. What I really like about this paper and this research is it shows that the kind of hard method of just do it, just get in there and make it happen, doesn't really work all that well because we have this learned story that says, no, that's not me. And if all you do is say your story is wrong, I got nothing really to play with. But if instead you walk me slowly, subtly, maybe I don't even notice you're doing it, but you're showing me all these different skills and I'm working and I'm building and changing my story as I go along, that's where you'll start to see people kind of pull the things that they once thought were out of bounds back into their realm. And here's where I'm gonna kind of leave it, sum it up. I've, I heard somebody say this once, I thought it was a great way of putting it. Most people mistake early difficulties and struggles with innate limitations. So think about it, post-stroke, I have some struggle, I have some difficulty using my left hand, must be an innate limitation, I never use it again. Students are the same way, struggling a little bit with math, must not be my thing, I'm done. What CIMT, what this kind of research comes out and says is, no, 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 it might take time, might take effort, 
Things are still online. We just got to do the work, the behavioral modifications, the thinking modifications that allow us to step up and access that stuff. If you never try it, if you never go deep into it, ain't never going to come out and you're going to spend the rest of your life thinking you can't do it. So thank you guys. I hope you all got something from that. I hope you're all well and I will see you guys soon.